So how's it going with your prayer life? We're four weeks into our preaching series uh, on prayer, and, uh, and I'm trusting that, uh, that this time of giving attention to your personal prayer life, to, to time alone, you and God, uh, is, is going to be leading you into a more intimate, life-changing life of prayer with God. Prayer is the greenhouse in which you and I are transformed into Christ-likeness. And that's why we are giving so much attention to this critical part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We prayed the Lord's Prayer a few minutes ago, and it's that prayer which we are studying. Each week we're looking at one phrase of the Lord's Prayer. I want to start off by by just inviting you to just become aware of the structure of the Lord's Prayer. It's very interesting to notice that... uh, that there's a, a set structure to the Lord's Prayer. And it's interesting to notice that the, the first four lines of the Lord's Prayer, the first half of the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray, is not about us. It's not about bringing our needs to God. It's not about telling God what's happening in our lives. But the first four lines of the Lord's Prayer are about God. Uh, it, they are about the God who, who reigns over all, and yet who is our Father. It is about praying, let your name, God, be honored. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And so the prayer that Jesus teaches us to pray teaches us that prayer begins when you declare to God, And you say to God, I am more committed to your will than I am to my own will. That life-changing prayer happens when we pray and say, God, I'm not here to convince you to bend to my will. But I am here to bend to your will. The Lord's Prayer teaches us that, that the purpose of prayer is to surrender our will to God, not to impose our will upon God. In prayer, we, we seek to, to orientate ourselves, to align ourselves with God, not to bring God into alignment with our own needs. So, so that's kind of a summary of what we have studied so far as we studied the first part of the Lord's Prayer. So today we're moving on to the part of the Lord's Prayer that is more about us. We're moving on to the part of the Lord's Prayer that is more about our needs. And more specifically, today's phrase that we are focusing on is the prayer which focuses on our physical needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Now I want to invite you to use your imagination. I want to invite you to imagine that you are a first century Jew. Your Bible is what we Christians call the Old Testament, what what is known as the Jewish, the Hebrew Scriptures. And you have grown up in Sabbath school, learning all of the stories in the Old Testament. And then you're sitting down on the hillside, and you hear Jesus teaching about prayer, and Jesus teaches you to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Let me ask you, which story in the Old Testament comes to your mind? when you think about the line of that prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Yes? Okay, but that's, no, that's not in your Bible. You're a first century Jew. What story in the Jewish Bible comes to mind when you, the story of manna in the desert, that's right, okay. The story of God providing food, daily food for the Israelites in the desert. When the first people heard Jesus teaching the Lord's Prayer, and they heard that line, give us this day our daily bread, immediately their mind would go to the story that Chris read to us from Exodus earlier of God providing manna for the people in the the desert. Do you remember that story? How how the people put a complaint uh, into God's complaints box about the lack of food in the desert. They say, God, remember those lacopoikis that we enjoyed in Egypt, all of that meat in, in, the, in the pot. And, uh, and so God responds to their complaints by showering, the, showering them with an edible substance called manna. 
And manna translated means literally, what is this? What is this? And God gives the manna to the people with very specific instruction. The manna was provided each day for each day. And so uh, the people were to learn daily reliance on God. They were to know that as we journey through life, we owe nothing, but we can trust God for our daily bread. Secondly, the people gathered manna each day for their clan. They learned that although God provided, they still had to work. They still had to go and gather it. They needed to collect it, and they collected it not just for themselves and their family, but for their clan. They were sharing. Third, the people were instructed that they were only to gather enough for each day so that there would be enough to go around. Do you remember how when the instruction was ignored, the manna that was hoarded uh, attracted maggots and went rotten and smelly? And this was God's judgment on our, our greed, on this human tendency to hoard out of fear for not having enough bread for tomorrow. And then there was the instruction about the Sabbath, that no manna was to be collected on the Sabbath day, but extra would be provided on the sixth day of the week, a reminder that life is about more than just surviving and working 24-7. Sabbath is the day to connect with God and with each other, with creation and with ourselves. And so when Jesus instructs us to pray, give us this day our daily bread, he is inviting us back to the story of the manna in the wilderness. And today, I want to suggest to you that there are, there are three lessons that, that we can take out of this phrase, give us this day our daily bread, as we think back to the story of God providing manna in the desert. And the first thing that we learn when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, is that everything we have is a gift from God. All we have is a gift from God. If you are a, a follower of Jesus Christ, you own nothing. To follow the God revealed in Jesus is to live with the knowledge that everything belongs to God. Psalm 24 verse 1 puts it well. It says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, everything in it belongs to God. Your home belongs to God. Your car belongs to God. Your smartphone belongs to God. Everything on earth belongs to God. And this truth is one of the ways in which Christians live differently to the way the world lives. We, we turn away from the idea of ownership, uh, and we, we see the world differently to the way the rest of the world sees it. In a world which makes an idol of ownership, which says the greater my net worth is, the greater my worth is, we declare the truth that all human beings, rich and poor, are of equal worth to God. And we are of infinite worth not because of our net worth, but we are of infinite worth because we are loved by God. We are of infinite worth and yet we own nothing. All is God's. And so Christ follows, replace the word ownership with the word stewardship. We are stewards of what God places in our care. We are answerable to our creator, the creator of the cosmos for how we steward the resources that God has placed in our care. What we have comes to us from God, just as manna came down from heaven to earth and provided for the Israelites. And so I want to invite you, as you think during this week in your prayer time about this line, give us this day our daily bread, what if that were to be an invitation to, to pray a prayer every morning that went something like this, God, God, thank you that everything that I have comes from you. I acknowledge that all that I have is gift. And as I go into this day, help me to steward my stuff. Help me to use my stuff. To spend the money that you've entrusted to me in a way that honors you. Thank you for this daily bread that comes from you. All provision is a gift from God. The second truth contained in the line, give us this day our daily bread, is that prayer for God's provision is about our needs and not our wants. Do you remember an idea that it still is around today, but I, I remember it especially from the 1980s when faith churches were springing up all over the place, that there, there was this idea that you would read about in Christian books that if you wanted something from God, you needed to be specific to God about what you wanted. So if you wanted a new car, 
You need to say, pray to God and you need to say, God, I want a car and I want it to be, I want it to be blue. And God, I, 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 I claim for myself a car that has leather seats. And God, I, I want a car with air conditioning. And that you needed to name it and claim it. And then you claimed it in the name of Jesus and believed it into being. Ever heard that thinking before? That's not what Jesus teaches when he teaches us to pray. He teaches us to pray, give me today my daily bread. And so we are to ask God for the things that we need. But there is a difference between the things that we need and the things that we want. And so often we, we look at those around us who have more than us, and we begin to feel a feeling of entitlement, thinking that uh, the things that we want are actually things that we need. We confuse our wants with our need. We lose perspective about what is truly a daily bread and what is poikikos. In his wonderful book, when, uh, which, by, uh, which is called When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box, it's written by John Ortberg. He invites us to learn the mantra when we look around at the things that we have and to learn to say the sentence, it could be worse. And uh, he tells the story of Snoopy lying outside on top of his kennel in the snow one Thanksgiving. And he looks in the window at the human beings sitting inside, tucking into their turkey and their gravy and their pumpkin pie. And he looks down at the dog food in his bowl that he must eat with the snow falling on it, and he's feeling really sorry for himself. And Snoopy ponders his misfortune for a moment, and then he thinks to himself, he says, still, it could be worse. I could have been born a turkey. <laughs> And, and John Ortberg, he goes on to encourage us to, to distinguish our needs from our wants and, and so to cultivate contentment by learning the phrase, it could be worse. And so, and, and so friends, I want to encourage you that, that maybe when you go out into the parking lot, you're going to think, how much nicer it would be if you had a nice newer car, like the car parked next to yours in the parking lot. And maybe you want to think about your, as you get into your car, think to yourself, you know, it could be worse. Maybe when you get home, you want to think about uh, how much nice, as you think about how much nicer it would be to have a newer, nicer, larger home. But as you cross the threshold to look around at your home and think, you know, it could be worse. If you're married, maybe you want to look across at your spouse and you might think about how much nicer it would be to have a, a newer, more expensive model and you want to say to yourself, it could be worse. <laughs> Can I encourage you not to say that one out loud, but to say it quietly to yourself? St. Paul teaches us that, that contentment with our daily bread is a learnt skill. I have learnt, he writes, to be content whatever my circumstances. And so when we pray for our daily bread, we pray for our needs. We don't pray for our wants. Third, notice that the prayer, give us this day our daily bread, is a prayer for our needs and not just for my needs. It's very interesting to notice that whilst Jesus encourages us to go into a room on our own and to shut the door and to pray to God, he encourages one-on-one -on -one prayer with God. But even as he does that, he goes on to teach us to pray, not in the singular, but in the plural. You notice that about the Lord's Prayer. Jesus doesn't say, go into a room and pray, my Father who art in heaven. No, no. He says, pray our Father who is in heaven. He doesn't teach us to pray, give, us, give me this day my daily bread. He teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And so we remember that as we pray to God, that he is not just my father, but he is the father of all. And as I pray for God's provision for me, I also want to be open to the needs of the people around about me. So often our prayers can be very narcissistic. We can place our own needs at the center of our prayer. And when we come before our father in heaven, 
And we pray, give us this day our daily bread. God opens our eyes to the needs of the people around about us. And so we do come to God with the needs that we have. I know that there, that there are needs in this congregation today for, for healing. There are needs in this congregation for medical expenses to be covered. There are needs here today that are very, very real. And God says to us that, uh, that we are to, to not worry, but to cast all our cares upon him. Philippians 4 tells us that we shouldn't be anxious about anything, but by prayer we are to make our requests known to God. Give us, God, this day our daily bread. But even as we bring our needs to God, we always ask God to open our hearts to the needs of the people around us. So friends, those, those three lessons about the line, give us this day our daily bread. We, we pray, first of all, that uh, we acknowledge that everything we have is gift from God. Second of all, we, uh, we pray for our needs and not our wants. And third of all, we pray for our needs and not just my needs. Now, I want to move on to just ask each one of you to consider another question this morning. And you don't need to answer it out loud. I just want to invite you to answer this question for yourself. I want to invite you just to think about how many of you have ever had to worry, have ever had to worry about where your next meal will come from. You know, when I consider that question, I know that I'm very, very fortunate. I have never, I've never gone to bed on a hungry stomach. I've never had any doubt that I would have food to eat when I woke up the next morning. And Whilst that may not be true for everybody in that room, this room, I suspect that it's true for most of us today. So for those of us who have never had to pray for, for food, who have never had to worry about going hungry, what does it mean for us to pray, give us this day our daily bread? I want to invite you to think about the, the truth that, that there are other hungers that this line of the Lord's Prayer can be speaking about. St. Augustine, when he preached this line on the Lord's Prayer, he said that this prayer is a prayer for spiritual food. Namely, he said, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the divine precepts which we are to think over and to put into practice each day. And there are many other saints of old who, meditating on this line of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. They have realized that for them, this is a prayer for nothing less and nothing other than Jesus Christ himself. And how did they come to this conclusion? Well, uh, let, me, let me turn to another passage of Scripture that we're going to look at now. And this passage of Scripture also references the providing of manna in the desert. It tells of a time when the disciples come to Jesus and they say to Jesus, Jesus, give us a sign. Give us a, a miracle so that we can know who you are. Just as, just as Moses gave manna in the desert. And so from John chapter 6 and verse 30, the disciples asked Jesus, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now listen to what Jesus said to them. He said, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And so here Jesus is speaking. He's speaking not so much to our physical hunger for food, but to the spiritual hunger that is in every human being, that hunger that we have for acceptance, for purpose, for forgiveness, 
for hope, for peace. The hunger deep inside every human being that only God can satisfy. One of the giants of South African Christendom and of South African Methodism is a man by the name of Peter Story. And Peter Story has just released his autobiography, and I spent much of my day off on Friday reading uh, his autobiography, and I was fascinated by what Peter wrote about his own discovery of Jesus, the bread of life. And I want, I want to read to you what he said about his own discovery, what he writes about his own discovery of Jesus who satisfied the deepest hungers of his soul. He wrote this, he wrote, This God won me, a divine lover, whose belief in me was infinitely more significant than my failing efforts at faith in him. A God who would never give up on me or the world he so loved. A God who wooed rather than threatened. His vulnerability was more winsome than his omnipotence. A God who transformed me not through fear, but by the expulsive power of a new affection. This God came to me in the story of Jesus. Friends, the, the God who is the bread of life, he comes to us. He comes to us in Jesus. He comes to us in Jesus' life and teachings, in his self-serving, self-giving death, in his resurrection, which conquers death and sin, he comes to us in the power of his Holy Spirit. And Jesus reveals himself as the bread of life that satisfies the deepest, deepest longings of our souls. And Jesus promises that when, that when we come to him in humble surrender, when we accept his lordship over our life, then we will never hunger in the deep places of our souls again. And so to pray, give us this day our daily bread. It can be to pray, it can be to pray, Jesus, give me yourself this day. I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your guidance. I need your lordship. I believe that you are the only food that satisfies my restless soul. I receive you into my life, the bread of heaven. Now, I want to share with you what we're going to do now before we move into Holy Communion. We are going to, uh, we're going to take up the offering. But don't dig into your purses just yet because I want to explain that you are not only going to place a love offering into the offertory bag today, but uh, as well as being passed the offertory bag, you will also be passed one of these baskets with bread inside of it. And I want you to take, uh, to take one of the, uh, the pieces of bread and just to, uh, uh, as the bread is passed, just to, just to take a little piece of bread and to, and to hold it in your hands. And as you do that, just to think about what is, what is your hunger right now? What does it mean for you to pray, give us this day our daily bread? There may be some of you for whom it is literally a prayer for provision of food for you, for your household. It may be that there is some other physical need, material need that you have in your life. and Maybe that's what that means for you. Maybe, maybe there's a deeper hunger in your soul. And it's Jesus, the bread of life, that you will be praying for. And so we're not going to sing during the offertory. Uh, but uh, but um, Jenny is going to be playing music in the background. And this is going to be a time of meditation for each one of you. Bring your gift to God and then receive this bit of bread. Just hold it. And then at the end, uh, and I will be praying over the offertory today. And uh, I'll just be also praying, leading us in a prayer to Jesus, the bread of life. So we bring our gifts and our offerings. And we also receive this bread, which is a symbol of, of what give us this day our daily bread means for you. Let us enter into this time of prayerful reflection together now.